the offers tend to be too good to be true quite often. They almost always are delivered via social media, right? So if you do a follow-up search, you don't find it coming in from other forms of mainstream media. It's exclusively social media. Not to say that good stuff doesn't get delivered via social media, but the bad stuff almost tends to be done so almost exclusively. Living that adult life in Singapore, we feel you. Between figuring out groceries that daily Kopi fix and sharing a flat with friends to split the rent, your bank account might be doing a silent scream. Today, we've got Raymond Tan, Head of Wealth Management and Preferred Banking at CIMB Bank, joining us to translate finance talk into real life hacks. Hi, Raymond, welcome to the show, how are you? Hi, Rishan, um, I'm good. Thanks for having me here. Absolutely, fantastic. So let's begin, Raymond, Social media bombards us with financial advice and get-rich-quick schemes. How do we separate the hype from helpful strategies? What are some red flags to watch out for when making investment decisions? I, I guess the thing about um, get-rich-quick schemes is that you've got to really, really be very, very mind mindful and be careful, right, uh, and vigilant. But uh, ultimately, it's you know really discerning the good from the bad, right? And uh, with regards to the bad. Typically, you know, if you focus on the content and the channel of delivery, it, it usually has certain features, right, which are quite easy to pick out, right? For example, a lack of disclaimers. Um, the offers tend to be too good to be true quite often, right? And then in terms of the channel of delivery, they almost always are delivered via social media, right? So if you do a follow-up search, you don't find it coming in from other forms of mainstream media. It's exclusively social media. Not to say that good stuff doesn't get delivered via social media, but the bad stuff almost tends to be done so almost exclusively, right? So I guess in a nutshell, uh, you should try to focus on just, you know, objective and trustworthy sources. If you are ever in doubt, the best thing to do would be to consult an expert. But in the absence of that, you can also talk to family, friends, or, or a financial advisor. Mm, yeah, very insightful tips. I think it's important for everyone to have a sort of filter based on the tips that you've just mentioned. Building a strong credit score is crucial, but what if you're just starting out? How can young adults with limited income establish a good credit history and use credit cards responsibly? Very often, uh, there might be temptations, right, to overspend because suddenly you find that you've got a blank check. There are very enticing offers, right, to take out loads of cards. So these temptations are there. It's important to try to limit the number of cards that you take up. Inculcate good habits, for example, settling your bills on time. And if you can, make the payment in full, right? Uh, and if you have to take up a loan, then you know, make sure that uh, you stay prompt. Why I mentioned that this is you know, pretty important and you know, people tend to overlook this um, is that uh, you've got to bear in mind that a couple of years down the road, you know, easily five to eight years down the road, you start planning you know, to get your own house or to start a family and that's when the mortgage is going to kick in and if you do not have a good credit score right, with the credit bureau, it's going to be a little bit difficult with the loan applications and all that with the banks at that stage. That's why it's really, really important uh, to start, all, start the journey right. Okay, so let's discuss planning a bit more. You mentioned having good habits, right? And this leads to kind of not being so stressed out about your financial health. So let's discuss this some more. Financial stress can be a major mental health concern. How can we break down financial planning into manageable steps and set realistic goals without feeling overwhelmed? Unfortunately, this is not covered in our school curriculum, right? Um, Th those who are start lucky and you know, study finance, you know, then you know they, they, they have a leg up, right? But for a lot of students coming in, um, they, they're not so well versed, right? So, so broadly speaking, uh, you should clearly define your goals, right? Uh, do track and analyze your spending, create a budget and stick to it, and uh, start investing early, right? So when you get your first paycheck, don't spend it all. Uh, you know, set aside a certain sum, right, to discipline regular investing. Uh, and all that, you know, is, uh, the whole idea behind all these uh, really so that you start saving uh, for the future early. Now, 
What's also very useful is that um, the MES recently launched uh, a, a basic financial planning guide. Uh, it's really um, plenty of rules of thumbs, right? And, and they are catered to different life stages. For example, you know, the broad advice that's provided is that you should look at you know, catering about three to six months of your expenses uh, and holding that in emergency cash, right? You should familiarize yourself with the national insurance schemes such as, you know, uh, all the shield plans. Uh, you shouldn't be committing more than 15% of that uh, to uh, insurance payments. But at the same time, you should be investing at least 10% of that money. I, I think that really try to inculcate that you start your uh, your investment journey early, uh, the retirement planning journey early, so that you're better prepared, right, for uh, for this event that's going to come up, you know, 30, 40 years down the road. Now, uh, for for Singaporeans, we're we're pretty lucky because uh, we have a safety net, and that's uh, the CPF Life Scheme. Uh, it's an insurance plan, and it comes with. Uh, three broad options with slightly differing payout. One basically steps up, the other is level, the third one steps down. So there's no one-size-fits-all you know, a recommended solution for everyone, but, but it's important that uh, we look at which plan um, probably suits us best and, and then have a look at that, study that before retirement so that we have a view uh, of you know, how much we're going to need to supplement on top of that, right, to have a nice, cozy re uh, retirement. Okay, so it really comes down to discipline and research, right? And like you said, there are guidelines yeah. available, so you can follow a path. Yeah, there's, there's really, really a lot of resources that, uh, that we can rely on, so long as we commit some time to do that. Fantastic, I like to hear that. So let's move on. Raymond, the world of finance is changing fast. With new fintech apps popping up everywhere, how do you decide between a traditional bank and a fintech solution? What factors are most important to consider when making this choice? Well, yeah, so fintechs are giving the banks a pretty good run, you know, for you know, as far as, uh, you know, um, attracting, you know, clients and and, um, and trying to get their share of wallet, etc. Um, I, I'd say that fintechs, however, are usually um, single service providers. They, they, they specialize in very, very specific areas and they tend to really, really go deep in that uh, aspect. Banks, on the other hand, would offer a more complete range of uh, services. Uh, but ultimately, you know, it's a, it's a personal choice. Um, I think reputation uh, is going to be something that's very, very important. So again, you know, research is important. Um, you, you, you do, if, you, if you're going to, um, you know, invest with a fintech, you, you want to make sure that uh, at least they're well established, they're backed by uh, large organisations, for example. So I think it's just very, very important uh, that you do your own uh, due diligence. Uh, yeah, but, you know, uh, brand, reputation, these, these are factors to consider. All these things matter. Cool. Any final thoughts, Raymond? I'd say, you know, it's really, really important just to start the financial planning journey early. My son just turned 18 and I'm so happy that, you know, he, he, he asked me over the weekend about how to invest. So, so, we, so, we, so he's starting early, but he's starting very, very small. It's not something that we talked about earlier. Um, you know, he's going in with the minimum investment amount um, and because he's starting to earn some income, you know, in national service. Uh, so, so he's putting some of that into investments. Uh, it's not just saving everything, you know, in a in a in an account, a savings account. Um, I think it's important to diversify. Um, right now, I think interest rates are very high, so there's a tendency for us to just place everything in fixed deposits, uh, and they are fairly high yielding and they are guaranteed and they are attractive, right? Uh, T bills are another example, but I think if you're investing for the long run, uh, you do need to do up your asset allocation, look at equities, you know, fixed income securities, etc. And, and also, you know, look at protection needs, right? We talked briefly about insurance earlier. Um, so, you know, critical illness, uh, total and permanent disability, um, hospitalization, etc. So all, all these are important needs that need to be taken care of. And you've got to then review your portfolio on a regular basis, you know, at least once or twice a year. If you're ever in doubt, then, you know, speak to a professional a financial advisor about this. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, what a privilege it is for your son to have you as his financial advisor. Yeah, and, I, and, I, yeah, and I don't charge any fees, right? Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. It was such a pleasure chatting with you. We'll do this again sometime soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you.
By taking the first steps today, setting realistic goals and seeking reliable information, you can build a secure financial future one step at a time. You've been watching Tea Time Tuesday. Until next time, keep seeking knowledge and financial empowerment.